Um, welcome to the Columbus School of Law. I'm Steve Payne. I'm the Dean of the Law School here at the, Columbus, at the uh, Catholic University of America. And it's wonderful to have you all here with us today. And I'm, I'm thrilled that Ambassador uh, Magarovsky has uh, joined us. Um, hope I came close on that, Am Ambassador. Um, but uh, it's, it's, I'm really thrilled to have you here. And um, I'm going to let uh, one of our students introduce the ambassador, but I thought I, I would say that um, we, um, we, we love our connection with, with Poland um, and our uh, program, uh, their programs there, including the um, International Business and Trade Summer Law Program. I have to look at that because they give me, you know, I-B-T-S-L-P. It's not exactly marketable, right? Um, the International Business and Trade uh, Summer Law Program um, that um, was um, founded by um, former Jagiellonian University uh, professor and our uh, uh, professor emeritus, Rhett Ludukowski, who's here with us today with his wife, Anna. Uh, welcome. <laughs> and um, the, uh, the late and wonderful uh, Dean Ralph Rohner, uh, God rest his soul, and I'm sure it is resting, um, in 1992, um, we have more than 600 U.S. JD graduates who have gone through that uh, program and almost 500 international graduates. Um, and, you know, we have uh, Polish alumni uh, throughout the, the country. Um, and, I, and I thought, I, I promised um, Leah I would do this, um, but I, I mean it from the mind and the heart. I, for the students who are here, I recommend this program to you uh, very highly. We have some alums here for, from the program. Um, and at least at alums of the program. And um, uh, I visited for the first time, I was supposed to go earlier, but it was pushed off because of the pandemic. I visited for the first time in um, this last summer. Uh, first of all, what a, what a beautiful city Krakow is. And um, loved strolling around there and at that huge uh, uh, square, uh, just fantastic. And, um, and yet small enough that I could run into some of our students on a park bench, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. Um, so I, I really encourage you to check that out um, and do it if you can. Um, it is a, it's a wonderful experience to go uh, with fellow students from here, but also uh, uh, Polish students and other, uh, potentially other international students um, as well. Um, we also have been doing our American Law Certificate Program since 2000 with the Aglonian University. Over a thousand graduates of the American Law Program there. Um, and we have our LLM in American Law Program um, that's celebrating its 20th anniversary next academic year. Um, and, and really the way that works is if the um, Polish students do the American Law Certificate Program and do the Summer International Trade and Business Program, uh, I didn't quite get the, that all, all correct, but and then come here for a summer, um, they can earn an LLM from us. And that's been a, a robust and, and great uh, program as well. Um, I also would encourage you um, to uh, if you're thinking about going to look at the clinical opportunities, I think I saw Catherine Klein here. This is Catherine. Catherine and Leah um, and Paul Kurth, among others, um, have great, I mean, really fantastic opportunities for students um, to get clinical experience over there with top countries and legal departments. Um, really, really a good opportunity. Um, and in fact, um, this cooperation between uh, our law school and Jagiellonian um, established the first successful legal clinic in Central Europe, um, and it became a, a, a model for others in civil law uh, countries. Um, so our folks really, really led the way in that. Um, so as I said, we're, we're very honored to have the ambassador here to speak with us on this important uh, topic in the, the war against uh, Ukraine and um, in, in Poland on the, on the border of that. It's important not uh, certainly not only to those uh, two countries, but to all of us, um, you know, the West and the world. Um, so we're looking forward to his uh, talk, and he's kindly agreed to do a bit of a question and answer uh, session after his, um, after his talk. So we're grateful for that. But now I'm going to turn it over to our third year law student and student bar association board member, um, also from Ukraine, uh, Lydia Korstil uh, Korstilova. Thank you, Lydia. Graduated from the Adam Mickiewicz University of Poznan 
with a degree in Hispanic studies. He was reporter, editor, and a columnist for over than 20 years with his expertise in economy, business, foreign affairs, policy. Pan Magyarovsky also served as a deputy editor-in-chief Forum, uh, Forum and Judge Pospolita. Around 2015, he was appointed as a head of the press office of the Chancellery of the President after working there as an, as an expert on public diplomacy. In 2017 and 2018, he served as an undersecretary of the state at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Before becoming an ambassador to the United States in 2021, he was as an ambassador of the state in, um, of Israel. Please welcome Ambassador Magyarovsky. I love my connection with Poland too, especially with my beloved wife, Anna. This is a very strong bond. Uh, this picture was taken six years ago, so don't let yourselves be deceived by appearances. Uh, I'm not that handsome, unfortunately. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, dear Mr. Payne, dear Leah, thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's an honor and a privilege for me to talk about the current situation in Ukraine and Poland's role in the ongoing conflict uh, in Eastern Europe uh, before such a distinguished audience. Um, thank you very much for your introduction. She wisely skipped some of the names of newspapers and magazines I used to work in, uh, although for her it's naturally much easier to spell those names, but uh, congratulations. <laughs> Your pronunciation is perfect, like you were born in Poland, by the way. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let me start with a quote. About 60 years ago, Nikita Khrushchev, a name you might be familiar with, the former Secretary General of the Soviet Communist Party, paid a visit to Warsaw, and he delivered a speech at the Soviet Embassy in the Polish capital. And he said, addressing the main enemy of the Soviet Union at the time, at the peak of the Cold War, the United States, saying, we will bury you. History is on our side. We will bury you. Fortunately, he miscalculated. We already know that. Uh, as did Mr. Putin about a year ago. He miscalculated because he didn't realize how coherent, how strong, and how resilient the free world was during the, the Cold War in that uh, proxy confrontation with uh, the Soviet Union. But those words, that particular phrase uttered by Mr. Khrushchev at the time, we will bury you. How reminiscent Mr. Putin's words today are of uh, those remarks made by Mr. Khrushchev at the Soviet embassy in Warsaw uh, at the beginning of the 60s. Uh, this leads me to a very uh, clear conclusion. For an overwhelming majority of Soviet and then Russian politicians, diplomacy is a zero-sum game. Someone has to win uh, crushingly in order for someone else to be defeated painfully and irreversibly. This is the notion of diplomacy Soviet and Russian politicians, foreign ministers, uh, decision makers have adhered to for decades. And they still do. For them, the diplomacy is not about uh, making and obtaining concessions. It's about defeating the enemy. And we can see that and we can hear that in so many remarks uh, today by uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, by President Putin himself, by Russian ambassadors uh, across the world. Uh, I, we both, we were lucky to uh, have lived under both systems. We were born under communism. We experienced command economy, uh, oppression. And then we lived under democracy. We enjoyed uh, free market economy, savage capitalism, especially at the beginning of the 90s, 
We enjoyed freedom of expression. We enjoyed democracy. So we can now see the contrast between communist rule and uh, the democratic system we live in nowadays. Uh, and it's striking to see those vestiges, if you will, of Soviet mentality in today's Russia. I will give you one telling example. Uh, you probably remember those reports about uh, mobile crematoria being brought to front lines in Ukraine in order to burn the bodies of the fallen Russian soldiers. We don't do that, do we? We do care not only about our soldiers, we also care about their bodies. We evacuate soldiers who were left, for example, behind enemy lines. But we also at least try to exfiltrate their bodies because human life and human dignity are so important to us. They are so important in our civilization. Therefore, uh, since uh, the beginning of the war, I've had uh, countless discussions with my, with my colleagues from other EU embassies uh, about whether we should define this confrontation as a clash of civilizations. To what extent Russia does not belong to our cultural circle? To what extent Russia is un-European? Unlike the Ukrainians who have, this is my strong belief, who have demonstrated how European they are. Is Russia European? Could Russia become European in the foreseeable future? It's a question I don't have a ready answer to, but I think this is a question we should ask ourselves constantly in order to understand what is going on now uh, in Ukraine and in Russia. In uh, July last year, President Putin uh, wrote and published a lengthy essay about historical connections between Russia and Ukraine, claiming that Ukraine is not even a nation. The Ukraine does not have, the Ukrainians do not have their own language, that the Ukrainians do not have their culture, they have no legacy, they have no history. Ukrainians are basically Russians, and the cradle of the Russian civilization was in Kiev, which is, well, partially true, but uh, not entirely correct. Uh, he despises Ukraine and the Ukrainians. Is it a racist approach to one of the immediate neighbors of the Russian Federation today? I would say yes. This is a question I do have a ready answer to. This is a racist approach to another nation. Quite paradoxically, uh, Mr. Putin has achieved a lot since the beginning of the war. He has strengthened the Ukrainian national identity. Before the war, very few people here in America or even in Europe knew what the Ukrainian colors looked like. Now, everybody recognizes the Ukrainian flag. There are flags are plenty in all American cities. We went to Lake Placid uh, last July. Lake Placid, near the Canadian border, uh, a very nice place, but pretty remote, I would say, when we saw hundreds of Ukrainian flags in Lake Placid, also in the Catholic Church. Uh, he has not only strengthened the, uh, the Ukrainian national identity and the Ukrainian pride, he also reinvigorated NATO. He reinforced the European Union's uh, cohesion. And he uh, basically enlarged NATO by himself, with Sweden and Finland about to join this organization shortly. I hope. Putin's primary fear is it is not Ukraine joining NATO, it is Ukraine joining the European Union. Uh, because this is the, the uh, most important driver and uh, has always been for many European countries to develop, uh, not only economically but also socially and politically. So prosperous Ukraine, wealthy Ukraine, democratic Ukraine, liberal Ukraine, and Ukraine, which is less corrupt, this is a nightmare for Mr. Putin and for the Russian ruling elite, because that would mean that it is possible for a post-Soviet Republic to become European, to become part 
of the free world, to become part of the West. If you wanted to see the beginning of the end of Putin's rule in Moscow, in the Kremlin, you don't need to look at Moscow. You don't need to look at St. Petersburg. Try to have a closer look at what is going on in Kazakhstan, in Azerbaijan, in Uzbekistan, in all those post-Soviet republics in Central Asia, but also in some uh, regions in the Russian Federation proper, like Chechnya, like Dagestan, Siberia. If all those countries and regions uh, decouple themselves, distance themselves, both politically and economically from the Kremlin, that would uh, kick off the disintegration of the Russian Federation as it is today. Before 1991, I think nobody believed that the Soviet Union would disintegrate so abruptly and in such, under such dramatic circumstances. But it did. I don't know what the future of the Russian Federation will look like, but I do not rule out also this scenario of, an, uh, of a disintegration of, of this country because there are so many internal tensions of uh, national character as well uh, that this country could really implode overnight. But Ukraine's future and Ukraine's fate is absolutely vital in this respect and uh, in the context of the continuity of uh, President Putin's rule in Russia. Uh, Ukrainians are our brothers, our neighbors. We have not always been very friendly to each other. We have fought wars against each other. But now we share a common enemy. And it is also our political and Christian obligation to assist Ukraine in this unequal combat in this unequal battle against the Russian aggressor. That's why we have already taken in, uh, well, more than uh, 2 million Ukrainian refugees. About 9 million of them have crossed the border with Poland since the beginning of the war. Many of them uh, re-emigrated to other countries some of them returned to Ukraine, especially when the situation somehow stabilized in the, in the western part of that country. But roughly 1.5 uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees did remain in Poland. And we have to combine two figures, those refugees I have just mentioned, and about, and also approximately 1.5 million uh, economic migrants from Ukraine who had lived and worked in our country before the war. And believe me, they integrate seamlessly, uh, perfectly into the Polish society, into the Polish labor market. Uh, luckily, our unemployment rate is ridiculously low, so we can absorb uh, even more waves of uh, Ukrainian refugees or migrants um, a month after the beginning of the war, the Polish parliament passed a law which essentially facilitates their integration in, in Poland. For example, all, all Ukrainians uh, can apply for a Polish ID, which does not automatically make them Polish citizens. Uh, nevertheless, they can uh, set up their own businesses, they can send their children to Polish schools, they are eligible for free healthcare. Thousands of them got vaccinated, uh, and I'm not talking only about COVID, but also other infectious diseases like measles. Um, and again, they are most welcome. We've had uh, in, in recent months about a dozen congressional delegations, members of Congress, American senators visiting Poland to see up close what is going on the ground and how we are dealing with this uh, particular issue. And they were asking my, my colleagues back in Warsaw from the foreign ministry, for example, could you please take us to one of those refugee camps in Poland? And, and my friends were staring at them in bewilderment, saying, but we've got none. All apologies. <laughs> because an overwhelming majority of those Ukrainian refugees uh, have been hosted in Polish homes by Polish families. There is not a single 
refugee camp in Poland. Um, interestingly, about 95% of those refugees are women and children. We've got very precise statistics on that uh, because we all know what the Ukrainian men are doing right now. And those women who arrive in Poland, they, always, they never say, I want welfare or I want an allowance. I want the Polish authorities to take care of myself and of my family. They always say, I want a job. If I want to stay here, I want a job. I don't want to be a burden for anyone. And they get a job. And they get a job. They start working. They raise their kids in Poland. They send them to a Polish school. By the way, we have, so far we have incorporated more than 200,000 Ukrainian children into the Polish schooling system. Uh, which is quite a challenge, of course, we, 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 because we don't have, you know, uh, there is some shortage of Ukrainian-speaking teachers in Poland, as you can imagine. Uh, but we are, we are doing our best to help them get proper education also uh, in Poland. I'm not saying this is a model to follow for other European countries, but if, we, if you have tracked, if you have followed all those migration crises, and I'm using the pool deliberately, over the last couple of years in, in some West European countries, you would see that uh, they have chosen a different model of integration. What we uh, offer uh, the Ukrainian refugees is not the fish, it's the fishing rod. We want them and we, we, we do, do appreciate, for instance, their contribution to the Polish economy. They are enriching us. So it's very interesting to, to see what will happen in the, in, the, in the months to come and in the years to come. Poland's population has actually increased by about 3 million people because of those ways of migration and, and uh, the inflow of refugees. And it's good. And it's good. And I feel, uh, I, I'm, I'm confident that uh, most of those Ukrainian refugees and migrants uh, feel at home in Poland. It's the social dimension of this uh, crisis and of this conflict. There are some other dimensions as well. Politically, as I said, Mr. Putin has miraculously strengthened our resolve, NATO's unity, and also the, uh, the solidarity among EU member states. Uh, and this is the bright side of this equation. On the other hand, I can see a new political or geopolitical, if you will, realignment in both the European Union and uh, NATO. Um, I've got uh, the impression that there are some countries which understand contemporary Russia much better than others. Uh, we have understood Russia for centuries, uh, like the Czechs uh, and the Baltics, all our Central European neighbors, but also, quite um, intriguingly, the Scandinavians and the Anglo-Saxons, not only uh, the Britons and the Americans, but also Australia, Canada, New Zealand. They seem to be much more determined and much more uh, attentive to what is going on in Russia and in Ukraine. They do understand Russia much better than some other West European countries, which I'm not going to name because I'm a diplomat. <laughs> uh, Poland, as I said, Poland has always understood Russia, Soviet and Russian mentality. I do love the Russian language. I'm, I'm, I'm enthralled by Russian culture. The Russian literature is absolutely amazing. Ballet, music, the litany is endless. Uh, still, understanding the Russian language, I don't understand the Russian today. We have understood Russia and the Russians for many years. Now it's much harder for me to decipher the, the Russian mindset under Putin's rule. Poland, for example, talking about uh, uh, energy security, which is one of the pillars of our collective security in Europe. Poland has always been prescient 
we all, we, we've known from the get-go that uh, Mr. Putin would one day use energy as a weapon. And he finally did, at the peak of this, of this ongoing uh, war in Ukraine, trying to blackmail European countries, uh, cutting off gas supplies. He miscalculated again. But we knew that he would uh, one day explore that avenue. And that's why, for example, six years ago, we inaugurated our first LNG terminal. Uh, in October last year, we opened the so-called Baltic Pipe, a gas pipeline which now transfers gas from the Norwegian uh, continental shelf via Denmark to the Polish stretch of the Baltic coast. And we are now, believe me or not, but we are now entirely independent of imports of Russian gas, as opposed to some other uh, Western countries uh, in Europe. This is quite an accomplishment, taking into account the importance and the significance of uh, energy uh, needs in Europe. Um, but quite sadly, I am a little bit concerned uh, uh, thinking about the future of our political and commercial relations with Russia, because this war will end at a certain point in the future. It must end. And of course, I keep my fingers crossed for Ukraine to win. Uh, by the way, I think we should also think about changing, modifying the terminology and the vocabulary we are using in this respect, because so many European politicians shy away from using the term victory. We do wish Ukraine victory, but uh, many others say we are helping Ukraine now because we, don't, we want Ukraine not to lose the war. It's not about not losing the war. It's about winning the war. It's about defeating the Russian army. It's about uh, pushing back the occupiers. It's not about not only not losing the war. So we should start with the right terminology. Uh, again, going back to my point about that, uh, that uh, concern uh, about our future relations with Russia, there are many politicians in Europe, also business circles, which would like uh, to return to normalcy, to business as usual, in our bilateral European relationship with Russia. I don't think we can return to normalcy after everything what uh, Mr. Putin has done to Ukrainians, that enormous, unimaginable suffering caused by Mr. Putin and his acolytes and millions of Russians who are supporting this war. Unspeakable atrocities committed uh, by Russian troops in Ukraine. Uh, strikes against civilian infrastructure. Isn't it a terrorist state? This is not only my private opinion, but it is. It is. And it should be treated as such. And I do believe that uh, maybe in uh, two, three, five, or ten years' time, there will be an international tribunal. Probably we would have to establish a new one, which will try sentence and punish all those murderers, all those responsible for crimes against humanity, which we are witnessing as we speak in Ukraine. On the final note, a few words about uh, Poland's uh, military aspirations. Uh, of course, we are, we are a frontline state, quite obviously, geographically. We have always been located between Germany and uh, Russia, which is not a very pleasant place to be. <laughs> there is a saying, there is a saying in Polish, if you, if you have always lived in a remote village somewhere in Eastern Poland, and you have never had the opportunity to cross a border, probably a border has crossed you. <laughs> this is what has been happening to us for centuries. Uh, we are arming ourselves. Of course, we are buying a lot of weaponry, mostly from American defense companies, but not only. 
Um, we do believe that the Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which is the foundation of, of the North Atlantic Alliance, is sacrosanct. And as President Biden has uh, stressed on numerous occasions, uh, we are going to defend every inch of NATO territory. Until recently, Poland has been perceived as a net recipient of security. Now, it is our goal and our priority to transition from this role to become a net provider of security. We are treating our obligations very seriously. We are very much committed to Article 5 and to the Alliance as such. So we are ready and willing to defend not only Warsaw, not only our immediate neighbors, not only Prague or Budapest, we are ready to defend Berlin or Paris or Helsinki once Finland joins NATO. Uh, even without Finland joining NATO, we would be ready to defend Helsinki. I believe so. Um, deterrence is key. The stronger Poland is, the stronger NATO is. This is quite obvious for us. We are not only uh, relying on American help. Of course, we would like to see uh, permanent presence of American troops on Polish soil. And we, we, do, we are pushing the current America, uh, American administration in this direction because we think this, this would be a, a good thing to do for all of us. We do insist on the necessity of having uh, a larger American military presence in Europe. And I can only echo the words of one of my favorite prime ministers in Europe, uh, Sanna Marin, the prime minister of Finland, who said a few weeks ago that without America and without American contribution in Europe, we would be in a completely different place and situation today. Uh, you can only imagine uh, where we would be, I mean Poland, if we had not joined NATO in 1999, alongside our friends from the Czech Republic and Hungary. Uh, maybe we, you would see Mariupol in southern Poland, and Bucha just across the border uh, in, in eastern Poland. This is a, a, a very uh, a frightening prospect, and that's why Poland is arming our, uh, itself, because we want to be prepared for any eventuality, in spite of all the uh, guarantees we receive as uh, uh, a NATO member. But we do know that uh, even if uh, Putin is no longer at the helm in Russia, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 years. I, I had the opportunity to attend uh, an event with uh, Bill Burns the CIA director last July in Aspen during the security conference, and he was asked about Mr. Putin's state of health. And he answered, well, uh, unfortunately, he's very healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Something in vain. Anyway, even if uh, there is no more Putin in Russia, we could get someone worse. Why not? Uh, uh, you know, a, a nationalist, a firebrand, a warmonger. Who knows? Russia is unpredictable. And again, Russia has always been, is, and will remain Poland's neighbor. It will not vanish miraculously from the map of Europe. Uh, so I would prefer Russia to be democratic, liberal, uh, and a free market economy. But I'm not terribly optimistic about Russia's future. It's so important for Mr. Putin to uh, to highlight the importance of reputation, of respect. Uh, he says, for example, that Russia is encircled by NATO. Russia is uh, endangered. Russia's future is jeopardized by the uh, ever-expanding West. But believe me, we have also heard so many nuclear threats coming from the Kremlin. We will bury you. We will nuke you. But uh, as a matter of fact, the only thing Putin has nuked so far is Russia's reputation. 
on the international stage. I feel so sorry, and uh, believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be sincere. I feel so sorry for so many Russians who do not identify themselves with Mr. Putin, who do not identify themselves with this autocratic, bloodthirsty regime. They would like to live in peace, and they would like to uh, be friends with the West, but they can't. And also their reputation has been, I believe, uh, tragically and irreversibly dented. Thank you so much.